It is February 1995. The place is RNZAF Base Ohakia, a major Air Force installation near the township of Bulls in New Zealand's North Island. From beyond the black stump, the Royal Australian Air Force has dispatched some of their best from Royal Australian Air Force Base Williamtown. A squadron of Australian F-18s is engaged in competitive tactical exercises and training with the best little air force in the world. Exercise Willow 95, its title embracing an acronym for Williamtown and Ohakia, is in full swing. Today, 77 squadrons McDonnell Douglas F-18 Hornets each aircraft costing close to 75 million Australian dollars are first off the ramp in a series of aerial antics and battles which will range wide across the New Zealand skies. Looking impressively evil something akin perhaps to Darth Vader's hostile fighting force, especially in their darker shades, these aircraft will test the metal of men and machines from the Royal New Zealand Air Force's attack wing. The RNZAF's attack wing today is an entity comprising just one aircraft type, an aircraft designed in the comparatively early stages of jet aircraft development. Alongside its competition, on the ground at least, its comparatively docile lines and size, and its unimaginative appearance, belie the sting it can, even now, deliver to a well-protected and organized enemy. This is that aircraft, McDonnell Douglas's A-4 Skyhawk, taxiing out to take its place with others behind Australia's F-18s. Now the only light attack aircraft in service with New Zealand's Air Force, this machine's ungainly gait on the ground hints somewhat unsubtly to its design concepts and lineage. Had it ever been used by its initial masters for its original intended purpose, the A4 would have provided one of the most exciting rides to oblivion available to pilots flying this and other types at the time. That this has never happened is almost certainly more a matter of good luck than good global management. But for today's Royal New Zealand Air Force, their A4s a controversial and perhaps unpopular choice when purchased for the service, have proven themselves as worthy adversaries alongside some of the most sophisticated weaponry available today. A factor which leads us nicely into the incredible value New Zealand taxpayers have had from these potent little stingers. Capital costs for the original 14 aircraft, then those subsequently purchased from the Royal Australian Navy, a complete update to all aircraft incorporating new wings, fuselage dehumping and strengthening, new avionics, and a significant armaments buy in the late 1980s all rolled together would buy no more than two, maybe three complete Australian built McDonnell Douglas F-18 Hornets. But things might have been different. As the A4 story unfolds before you, we explore, albeit somewhat superficially, some of the issues which led to New Zealand's acquisition of these fine aircraft, an aircraft which has faithfully served more than 25 years in South Pacific skies.
These aircraft, McDonnell Douglas's A4K Skyhawks, are among a total of 20 serving with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Collectively, they hold a distinction some might describe as dubious. With a little over 25 years of continuous service, these aircraft are the longest serving of any front line fixed wing attack aircraft ever operated by the RNZAF. Of course, their length of service has been eclipsed by a number of other aircraft, with several such types still performing key roles under New Zealand's Defence Forces umbrella. It's no secret that aircraft operated by the Royal New Zealand Air Force have built up record-breaking flying hours. During the 1980s decade, the service's A4K Skyhawks had posted such a global record. But back in the 1960s, similar problems were evident, and the expected rejuvenation of an outdated strike wing was not to be an easy one. Indeed, the RNZAF itself initially wanted nothing to do with one suggested replacement, Douglas's diminutive Skyhawk. Having espoused that clear signal during the tenure of Air Vice Marshal N. Morrison, Chief of Air Staff from July 1962 to July 1966, the service was aggressively suggesting other alternatives. There was still no decision on the strike replacement. So the remaining chore that I did was to go direct to the Prime Minister and make the case for F4s, which to my mind were the ideal thing then for the strike replacement. Well, that of course was unusual, to say the least of it, and it caused a storm. With Air Vice Marshal Morrison's retirement, the service's incoming Chief of Air Staff, Air Vice Marshal Cam Turner, continued a consultative process boiling within the RNZAF. The principal endeavour to reach a practical and logical recommendation to central government on replacements for two outdated strike wing aircraft types. Yes, I first became involved in the so-called strike replacement program as a young pilot officer at Ahakia when the then uh, Chief of Air Staff, Ian Morrison, came to Ahakia and he brought Frank Gill, I think it was AOC operations at the time, and we held this uh, rather grandiose strike symposium and it was a great concept because he involved all of the, the strike air crew in it. And I think I was involved in giving some part of some presentation on one of the many aircraft we looked at. I think originally we looked at something like about um, 10 or 15 different potential aircraft from, from Britain and from the States. And we whittled these down, I think, to about 8 or 10, uh, of which at the top was the F-111 Swing Wing General Dynamics Bomber that the Australians subsequently got, followed by number two was the F-4C Phantom, the Donald Douglas Phantom. And right at the bottom of this was the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. I know for a fact that um, Air Vice Marshal Morrison made himself very unpopular by suggesting to the government that we should get swing wings. I think he was actually angling for the F-4C Phantom. An aircraft we were never to see. British built de Havilland vampires and venoms progressively entered RNZAF service as early as 1951. They performed in frontline service in Cyprus, Malaya, and at home in New Zealand with permanent and territorial Air Force squadrons, essentially replacing P 51 Mustangs in territorial service. English Electric Canberras, meanwhile, had been purchased to replace the vampires in 1959. This twin-engined, two-man crew aircraft served in Singapore and Borneo. Other Canberras were based at Ohakia from 1960 through to 1970. All but one was sold to the Indian Air Force that year. But in 1968, most serving personnel in the RNZAF would never have considered in their wildest dreams that a tiny, naval-styled aircraft would be considered a logical replacement for the combined firepower of both vampires and Canberras. A New Zealand evaluation team headed by Air Commodore Frank Gill 
had that same year traveled to the United States of America to take a long, hard look at the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. The Douglas Aircraft Corporation's A-4, essentially a replacement for the United States Navy Douglas A-1 Sky Raiders, incorporated a relatively simple design philosophy. Its design team, headed by Ed Heinemann, came up with an aircraft which exceeded U.S. Navy expectations right from the start. With short crop delta wings, featuring leading edge slats, spoilers and flaps, and fuselage mounted air brakes, the A-4 was given the compactness and landing characteristics suited to aircraft carrier operations. Three spars in the wings not only helped to form internal fuel tanks, but provided the strength to carry external stores and fuel, plus internal fuel totaling more than the Skyhawk's own weight. The entire wing assembly was simply bolted to the A-4 Skyhawk's fuselage. The fuselage was designed as an all-metal conventional semi-monocoque construction. Production models featured a snap-up nose assembly, allowing easy access to a radar antenna and associated equipment in that bay. A brake point allowed for the whole tail assembly and rear fuselage to be detached, providing ready access to the single engine. The prototype model, with a striking resemblance to this animation, first flew on the 22nd of June, 1954. A-4 Skyhawks finally entered service with the United States Navy in September of 1956 and with the United States Marines in January of 1957. The A-4 Skyhawk really earned its reputation during the Vietnam War. Although essentially a carrier-borne aircraft, it operated successfully from prepared airfields in South Vietnam as well. Close support and interdiction roles, hazardous in the environment that was Vietnam, became its main roles. Significantly though, it built a reputation as a tough, reliable aircraft. Its operational availability was said to have been 95% and its survival rate, or ability to complete an average mission, was calculated at 90%. Possible mechanical problems aside, no doubt the A4's tiny profile, handling characteristics and low flying abilities at good speeds made it a difficult target. Air Commodore Frank Gill and his Skyhawk evaluation team had left for the USA, the A-4 had been developed to meet perceived export potential criteria. The impressive service record of the A-4s, coupled with the knowledge of recent export orders to Argentina, Australia and Israel, must have been a powerful influence on the team. The Australian government had ordered 10 A-4G model Skyhawks in 1965. By 1968, these had been delivered to Australia's fleet air arm, eight of which were firmly ensconced aboard the Royal Australian Naval Aircraft Carrier Melbourne, the flagship of the fleet. Two of the Australian two-seat trainer variants, with a fuselage two feet longer than the single-seat A4, could not operate from the Melbourne due to centre of gravity differences. And so the scene had been set. Air Commodore Gill and his team obviously liked what they saw, at least in terms of what was affordable. Thus, with the authority already granted by the New Zealand government, a suitable purchase package was immediately negotiated in Washington. Many within the RNZAF were known to be bitterly disappointed with the selection. Ten pilots had been selected to travel to the USA in January 1970 for A-4 training. They were to follow a syllabus developed by squadron leader Donaldson, the RNZAF's one-man advance party who had been in the U.S. since 1969. Among them 
was Flight Lieutenant Ross Ewing. Look, there were 10 of us drawn from Canberra's and vampires, and we went to Florida to a uh, naval air station called Cecil Field, or Cecil Field if you're American. It's near Jacksonville in Florida, northern Florida. And we were attached to an attack squadron, BA-44, which were actually on the wind down. And they were to do our training. So we hopped in a Hercules and were flown over there. And um, when we first arrived, there, there weren't any of our aeroplanes there. So we started training on, on Navy, US Navy TA-4Fs, I think they were, or Es. And we all flew with American US Navy uh, instructors, who were generally very good. They were experienced. Um, quite a few of them had been to Vietnam, um, so experienced in more ways than one, pretty laid back, the whole lot of them, and, uh, and it was good. I think the training went extremely well, uh, well organised, um, and during that training we were asked to uh, go back to the west coast. We flew over Civil Air and picked up our aircraft as they came off the line at Long Beach, California, and then flew them right across the states. That was great. I did a couple of those and uh, uh, in two legs. You stop somewhere near the middle of the states and then head on to, to Jacksonville. And that was great. Uh, we just walked up to the, um, the factory there and there was a brand new Skyhawk. Three fuel tanks filled up and off test flight and they said, there it is, take it to the east coast. Great. So I think I was 26 at the time and we, most of us had um, uh, U.S. Navy guys who we would follow. We'd go in pairs, or usually pairs, two at a time. Uh, and we would traverse the United States. And that was, that was a highlight, in fact. When we first saw the aeroplanes, they were quite different from the U.S. Navy ones at uh, VA-44. Our, our aircraft, apart from being camouflage, which made them different, they had this hump on the, the top or dorsal surface of the aircraft the so-called ECM hump and we said oh that's good we've got lots of ECM gear and we're told quite quickly that no well actually there isn't anything in there at the moment but that's where the ECM gear will go and so we carried this empty hump around for for years. The A4's humps designed to carry electronic countermeasures equipment were never to be needed. As an aside one lucky New Zealand pilot Ken Cox accepted an invitation to observe A-4 operations aboard a U.S. Navy training carrier, the USS Lexington. This provided a unique opportunity to see firsthand how the A-4s stood up to carrier operations. Base training for the RNZAF's pilots and 48 ground crew was, meanwhile, rapidly completed. And by May 1970, New Zealand's 10 A4K single-seaters and four TA-4K twin-seat trainers had been assembled on the United States' western seaboard. Cocooned to protect them from the elements, the A4s were loaded aboard a United States aircraft carrier, USS Okinawa, for transport to New Zealand. Modelled on the A4F Skyhawk, but with some variations to that model, some of her A4Ks were lucky to reach Auckland. Lashed to USS Okinawa's flight deck, the aircraft took a pounding during a huge storm, apparently the worst ever experienced by the ship. For a short period, a part of New Zealand's $24.6 million investment was in some jeopardy. But on the 17th of May, 
USS Okinawa safely docked at the Port of Auckland and its valuable cargo was unloaded. These activities brought with them some considerable interest from the public. Also attracted was a band of anti-Vietnam War protesters whose antics marginally slowed deliveries to RNZAF base Fanuapai. The aircraft were towed through Auckland city streets and then by road to Fanuapai. As though like giant birthday presents, an eager ground crew set about unwrapping the aircraft and bringing them back to airworthy standards. Fanuapai was not to be the A4's final home. Once airworthy, the aircraft were progressively flown to RNZAF base Ohakia. The first to arrive was the two-seat trainer NZ6254, flown into its new home by 75 Squadron's commanding officer, Squadron Leader John Scrimshaw. NZ6254's arrival brought with it a period of renewal. With that too came the birth of new ideas, strategies, systems, learning experiences, and subsequently expertise. By the time dust fell over base Ohakia on the 27th of May 1970, all 14 Skyhawks had arrived at their new home. Flying the Skyhawk operationally was very different from flying either vampires or canvas. Mindsets had to be challenged too. Uh, the vampires were 1940s, 50s design, made of plywood, very, very basic aeroplane, and suddenly here we were with a brand new, not quite state of the art, but brand new American, potentially supersonic uh, aircraft. So it was quite a transition, I think most people would agree. It was, uh, the leap was very noticeable. It was, it was really a big step up from the Vampire, and that, I guess that uh, includes height from the ground, um, speed-wise, um, just being a modern new aeroplane, and it, uh, it was really a big difference. Suddenly you had an aeroplane that was uh, designed with the pilot in mind, and uh, you know, checks going from left to right around the cockpit, everything laid out in a, uh, a nice formal manner, whereas poor old Vampire was uh, designed around an engine and, a, and they thought, gee, we better put a pilot in there. So they'd throw him in there and then half the radio switches would be one side and half the other and it was really a real shambles. Here's the Vampire Mark V, which was the, the single seat version. Um, the T11 was the, the, the two seater that we had. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, a very small book. It tells you what you need to know and how about going about doing it. And uh, on the back there, it's even got some of the checklists, and uh, I see the over, over the fence speed was about 95 knots, so it's all there, and uh, away you go. Suddenly you're presented with uh, the A4 pilot's notes, which obviously are not designed to take into the cockpit at all, and uh, there's a fair amount of um, information in this book, from emergencies to checklists to servicing procedures. So uh, one really had to get to know that completely, and you felt you did, but there were always little things that would pop up that would, would sometimes bite you or you know, give you a wee kick anyway. We flew the cameras at low level for a lot of the time, although it was designed as a high level bomb, we actually flew them at low level. But the, the A4 was a highly maneuverable fighter type aircraft, and the dimension goes with, with that aircraft, if you like. So you're maneuvering the aircraft at, uh, to, a, to a greater degree, probably. It was certainly a high workload and a, and a steep learning curve, I guess, for all of us. The job wasn't exactly the same, and in a lot of ways it was more difficult. Even if there were two people in the A4, the, the, the job, the task was more difficult. Yeah, a delta wing, um, round base turn, I guess, is, uh, is where you're going to get into trouble. Uh, high angles of bank, um, high rates of turn, and you're going to have high, high rates of sink. Um, however, the aircraft was equipped with angle of attack indication and these were used on, on all approaches and in fact, you know, from the downwind you'd throw away your airspeed indicator and, and fly angle of attack. Which in our day uh, was a little thing that sat up on the left of the combing there called a donut, a little light that came on. The idea was to, to fly the donut and this was the angle of attack which the airplane wanted to land at. Now that would vary depending on your weight, but it's a constant angle of attack. So rather than try and fly an angle of attack gauge in the cockpit. They had this little donut arrangement which you used to just adjust the aircraft's attitude until you were flying the donut and then you knew you were flying the correct speed and angle of attack 
for that weight. So you didn't have to calculate your landing speed, which in many aircraft you do. So I think that helped to get rid of a lot of the problems that, that were normally associated, certainly with delta wings and aircraft of this weight. We were disappointed in the, in the gun sight, the bomb sight. It was very primitive and we soon found out there were no weapons for us to practice with. However, the, you know, the capability there for, for different weapons was, was immense and uh, that wasn't really a problem. However, you, you could say that the aircraft only had two cannons, whereas the Vampire had four. Although in its final years we could only fire two at once anyway because of, they tend to break the main subframe, which was only wood anyway. Um, so yes, there was that aspect. And the gun sight, I guess, was, was another big factor. The A4 had really a China Graph pencil mark on the windscreen. That's not quite true. It was a, a depressible radical um, that you could wind down to get your depression for whatever weapon you were dropping, whether it be the, the gun or the bomb or the rocket. Whereas the Vampire had a gyroscopically controlled air-to-air -air gun sight, which could be adapted for air-to-ground groundwork as well. So the Vampire gun sight, yes, was ahead of the A4. Practicing air-to-air -air refueling had an emptiness about it too, an aspect we look at in more detail later. The, the advent of air-to-air air, air -air refueling was a, a whole new ball game for us. We'd never ever contemplated it, done it before in the past at all. So that was something totally new for us. And it was quite a, a tricky little sport to get the hang of, but, but we did. There was no duel. You were just told what to do and then told to go and do it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I think we all enjoyed it. And we used to go out in groups of four uh, behind the buddy tanker, which was a center line fuel tank with a retracting uh, hose and drogue, shuttlecock type drogue and we had to try and get our, um, our probe into this little dancing little uh, shuttlecock and it was a lot of fun and we all used to watch each other have a go and then go off to the side and the next chip have a go and uh, that was quite exciting and, and a lot of fun but once you got the hang of it I think um, not too difficult. All we were permitted to do were, were what they called dry plugs. Um, the reason being that uh, it was said that a fuel leaked out from around the coupling it would go straight down the intake and cause cause a fire. Although new and thoroughly effective in their design roles, 75 Squadron Skyhawks were not well endowed with their avionics package. What we're looking at here is a pre-Kahu Skyhawk cockpit and a number of items of avionics equipment which was in that cockpit. All of this equipment is now obsolete and has been replaced in the modern Skyhawk. The first item we'll look at is the nav computer here, the ASN41. Second item, the radar indicator, is this item here. And the third is the, the big attitude indicator ball in the middle here, which is this item down here. The nav computer was an all mechanical device, electromechanical with lots of gears and cogs. Whoever designed it certainly earned their pay. In its day, it was one of the most modern and accurate navigation computers in any aircraft in the world during the 60s. Uh, however, today it's uh, completely out of date and inaccurate compared to a modern inertial navigation unit. We bought the Skyhawk in 1970, but already at that stage it, it had some history. So we, were, we weren't buying entirely 1970s technology. And of course, 1970s technology looks pretty archaic by the 1990s uh, standards. Um, but there, there was some equipment in the A4, like the old analog navigation computer, full of gears and disks and things, which was already fairly old. But of course, digital equipment was not available at that stage. So we were seeing the end of, of an era, if you like, of, of equipment. Um, so th there, were, there were major uh, deficiencies by today's standards. Uh, and really even starting to show apparent deficiencies by the 1970s standards when we bought the aircraft. And the, the system when it was going was, you know, probably plus or minus a couple of miles, maybe a bit better if you had a good one, but you, you never knew. And, uh, you know, we tried to tune them up, we tried to log them and all that sort of thing, but uh, no, they were, they were pretty erratic. Uh, and they worked on a system of um, you'd dial in your present position, and you'd dial in up to two destinations, and then it would compute the, the heading and the, uh, the distance 
to either of those destinations that you had dialed in. And it would work on the, um, on the Doppler that the aircraft had, on giving a ground speed and a, and a drift to the system. And if that cut out, then it would go to a, uh, an air mass mode where the, the air data computer would take the, um, the information that the last had from the Doppler and compare it to the, the air data that it was gathering around the aeroplane and, and work out its computations from there. But it, it never was all that accurate. It was excellent. Uh, if you're in cloud, had, an, had a problem, and you suddenly wanted to divert to, to uh, Dunedin, say, you could dial in Dunedin, and yes, it would flash you in the, in the general direction and away you go. But for actually bombing a target, it wasn't really on at all. It worked extremely well going from uh, east to west, but not very well going north to south. So the error and drift, as far as finding points, was uh, a bit more pronounced than it would have been with the F-4. F-4 had an inertial platform in it. And that inertial platform actually gave us a better reference as far as fine. The next item we'll look at is the Abba Jabba, or All Attitude Indicating System. As you can see here from the ball as it rotates, it indicates to the pilot his attitude and reference to the earth. And this was the pilot's primary flight instrument, heads down flight instrument. It comprised the indicator in the cockpit, the gyro unit and the power supply which were in the nose of the aircraft. And today, this is completely replaced by a head-up display and an inertial navigation unit, which presents the information in the head-up display. Yes, one of the most prominent instruments when we first got in the A4s in Florida was this big artificial horizon sitting right in the middle of the instrument panel and called the Abba Jabba. And we said, what is that? And they said, that's, that's the AJB3A, which is what its technical name was. And of course, it got called the Abba Jabba. It was certainly, I believe, an endeavour to get uh, one instrument that would tell you all about your attitude uh, and it would do pitch and roll and of course it was uh, tumble free so it didn't matter whether you were pointing at the North Pole or the South Pole and of course it gave you heading. It was a particularly powerful instrument. You got to uh, use it all the time whilst you were flying. Um, your average artificial horizon would probably topple if you got too much bank or pitch on. And here we had a machine that you could uh, go to any point uh, around the horizon and it would tell you where you were. You could do aerobatics on it, you could do all sorts of things. So in effect we were taking a major step forward from a very old technology in the, uh, what was the vampire to me. The A4 basically had no air-to-air -air radar for air-to-air uh, -air combat so that was uh, uh, not not quite as hard. The air-to-ground radar was good, but we didn't use it for any bombing modes or anything, whereas the F-4, we did use that for bombing modes. It was a brave man who went off and used the, uh, the radar for terrain, terrain following, I think uh, it was called, because, of course, the link between the radar and the aeroplane was you, and uh, at that height, we were not permitted to use autopilot, and so you were still physically flying the aeroplane while trying, trying to look at the, uh, the radar and that was uh, most demanding. And then, of course, we came to the realisation that if there was more than about 11 knots of crosswind component, you were flying outside of where the radar was looking. And so uh, we fairly soon went back to navigating at uh, minimum safe altitude rather than 1,000 above uh, ground. Instrument or IFR flying restrictions were lifted with the commissioning of Baso Hakia's TACAN, a tactical aid to navigation, in September of 1970. Following hard on its heels was the release of rockets and 20mm cannon rounds. 75 Squadron was now in a position to build on its developing strengths. With most resources now in place and available, a renewed sense of purpose and vigour was rapidly injected into 75 Squadron Skyhawk pilots. Even so, whether or not anyone had given much thought to one further matter might still be debated today. Perhaps the RNZAF's A4s look just a touch too pretty. Um, this was, a, a, as I said, a quantum leap for the RNZAF. We got a lot of it right, I believe, but we got a few things wrong or we hadn't quite thought them through or had time to or whatever. And the camouflage was a, a pretty much a non-standard camouflage. It wasn't really a jungle camouflage, which most of us would have expected. The other thing that we noticed was a lovely camouflaged aeroplane to sort of make it hard to see, but we had these bright white drop tanks on, which would stick out literally miles away. And of course, the pilot's helmet was also painted 
uh, bright white at the time. So there's another beacon for anyone who's trying to home in on you. So, but these were all in time overcome, and that was just part of the the settling down process, I think. We're in the atrium of the RNZF Museum at Wigram, and behind me is the RNZAF Museum Skyhawk. This aircraft was an ex-United States Navy aircraft that was presented to the museum and has been reconfigured and painted in the colour schemes and markings of the Skyhawk as it was delivered to the RNZAF in 1970. The aircraft is in the standard Southeast Asian scheme, the Vogue at the time, tan, dark green, a mid-green and grey undersides. It also carries distinctive markings around the inlet and parts of the aircraft which move like the slaps and flaps so that the ground crew could be aware of the danger areas on the aircraft when it was on the ground. You will also notice the undercarriage of the aircraft is painted glossy white on the nose legs and both main legs. This is done to make it easy for, to maintain and so that if any hydraulic leaks appear they are quickly detected on the white surface. The pylon tanks on the aircraft are now camouflaged. Originally they were white However, it was found that they compromised the camouflage of the aircraft when it was seen from above, and so they have been painted to reduce that visible impact. The pylon underneath the aircraft, also carrying the weapons, is glossy white, and once again, for the maintenance purposes, it's easier to keep clean. The weapons are in the standard colour, but they appear on the aircraft as of today, with the different colours on the bombs denoting the type of bomb uh, and the fusing fitted. The aircraft carries also a unique United States Navy method of showing the individual serial number. And you can see it's got 207, which is the last three numbers of the aircraft serial number, NZ6207. You can also see up here the intake markings, very distinctive, red for danger, a good alert to the ground crews that there is something in that area that they should be aware of and keep clear from. And this particular aircraft has the very early squadron markings that you can see up there, the typical 75 squadron markings consisting of the squadron badge and the yellow diamonds on a red background which is unique to this particular squadron. It is not worn by any other squadron in the RNZAF or the RAF. The Skyhawk also adopted the standard American practice with the roundels. On these aircraft there is only a roundel on the upper left wing and one on the lower right wing as opposed to the six positions that we normally used to have them in the wings and the fuselage. You can also see we continue the same practice at the back of the aircraft with the warning signs, the red flaps and the warning signs for the crew don't stand here. This is the second type roundel that the Skyhawk used. The, when they were delivered it had the, the standard RNZF roundel at the time which was red, white and blue with a silver fern imposed on the centre. And then in 19, late 1970, we adopted the standard Kiwi rounder, which is still used today. Although, of course, on the new aircraft, with the new scheme, the white is removed and we only have a blue and red roundel. You can see the large serial number on this aircraft, once again in that standard United States Navy grey, and the distinctive A4K designation, which is also typical United States Navy, so it shows you the particular model of the aircraft that is, uh, it's carried on. The standard barber pole, the arrestor hook. Once again, a distinctive colouring and marking to show the hook when it is in the down position to the ground observer. A different view of the aircraft, one looking from above. Notice the large fin flash on the back, the white of the roundels on the wing and the fuselage, and the white on the squadron markings, all compromising the basic camouflage scheme. These have been removed in the new scheme. Above the squadron marking, you can see the large electronic hump where the rotating beacon is. This was never fitted with any equipment and was subsequently removed as part of the Kahu upgrade. Above that again is the very large white UHF VHF blade antenna. This was quickly painted to a black colour, so once again not to compromise the camouflage scheme. Note in this museum example that the pilot is wearing one of the earlier helmets, which is white. These have been subsequently changed over the years to the current helmet, which is painted in olive drab, a very similar colour to those on the front of the aircraft. The need to paint aircraft drop tanks became apparent. In fact, during 75 Squadron's first overseas deployment to Australia, which took place in March of 1971. By this time, 14 Squadron had taken over pilot conversion training but relied heavily on 75 Squadron for aircraft and support. 
And so New Zealand's 14 McDonnell Douglas A4K Skyhawk settled into the rhythm of an operational wing. By late 1972, the service's vampires had gone, being progressively replaced by BAC-167 Strike Masters. This high-performance jet training aircraft is powered by a single Rolls-Royce Viper 20 engine, developing 3,410 pounds of thrust. With a maximum speed of 450 knots, the Strike Master is armed with two 7.62 millimeter machine guns and an assortment of rockets and bombs of varying size. Because the training is intense, it's a constant struggle to keep up with the exercises, both on the ground and in the air. It is planned to ensure that those who survive it are well equipped to handle split second... In 1975, Strike Masters displaced the Skyhawks of 14 Squadron for strike conversion training, and all Skyhawks were consolidated into 75 Squadron. For the young pilots selected to specialize in the attack combat role of the RNZAF, it's just a few steps from the Strike Master to the Skyhawk. They're both based at Ohakia, but they're big steps. It means more training, more exercising, more briefings, and above all, more flying. It must become an absolute alliance of man and his machine. 75 Squadron regularly hosts Allied aircraft. A United States F-15 climbs spectacularly from Ohakia's runway. Another supersonic visitor is the Royal Australian Air Force's F-111 Swing Wing Strike Aircraft, which exercises with New Zealand Skyhawks. 75 Squadron's regular contact with friendly forces and deployments overseas brought continuing training benefits. With New Zealand's relative isolation from defence partners and spheres of influence, considerable store was placed on the fact that the A-4s could be refuelled in the air from a variety of tanker aircraft. But 75 Squadron was building an enviable reputation with New Zealand's defence partners and allies. No easy task considering the massive support an operational squadron needed to draw on from a very small Air Force infrastructure, particularly when heading overseas. It's not just the aircraft and the pilots that go, it's the spare pilots and all the ground crew, and normally about 100 guys or so. And that entailed three C-130 loads and a P-3 which was used um, for our long-range communications, really, and keeping an eye on our navigation, which was necessary with the old system. And if the guy in the P3 said, we reckon you're 30 miles south of track, you'd say, I'm not going to admit it, but I believe he's right. And you'd probably go uh, right hand down a bit or something like that to, uh, to counter uh, for that. Keeping the Skyhawks airworthy required a high level of engineering expertise. With close to 6,000 parts to each Pratt & Whitney J-52 engine, maintenance was not a task to be taken lightly. Neither was the task of arming the aircraft. With a growing range of weaponry on its inventory, the skill of the squadron armourers was a vital link in the operational chain. These ground trades contributed in their own way to the New Zealand Skyhawks' reputation in a policing role, elevated in March 1976 following a brief surface engagement with a Taiwanese squid boat in the Tasman Sea. Although described elsewhere as an angry response to a foreign fishing boat's incursion into New Zealand waters, it was probably more a matter of government frustration which led to squadron leader Jim Jennings' forthcoming actions. The, uh, the mission from there was, uh, took a little while to brief up. The aircraft were armed and uh, myself and John Heron uh, went, were launched on this particular strike. The, uh, the first thing we had to do was go out and join up on the P3, uh, which was some 70 miles out west of New Plymouth. From there it was fairly obvious there was one uh, fairly large trawling boat going at fairly high speed in a westward direction. Uh, and all we had to do was wait until we got the various clearances and authentication to actually do something about it. The, um, the brief itself was to uh, fire the Zuni rocket which we were carrying as a last resort. 
and to start off initially with uh, 20 millimetre guns, about a, uh, 300 metres in front, not at it, but enough to show the intent and to, to come progressively closer to the point there where we might have to use rockets to, uh, to enforce what we were trying to do. I was the lucky one who, uh, as the leader, got the clearance and in about two microseconds I was squeezing the uh, trigger to uh, let off the first burst of rounds, a total of 53 of them in fact, and um, I made sure that that burst was a very long spread in front of the, uh, the ship. Uh, that was all that was required. It's the, uh, the, the quickest stop of any boat I have ever seen. Uh, it literally stopped dead in the water. The Kim Nam was subsequently arrested by a boarding party from HMNZS Taupo, a New Zealand Fisheries Protection Patrol boat. Throughout the 1970s and through to the mid-1980s, 75 Squadron's A4K Skyhawks were regularly exercising in Australia, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and progressively within United States spheres of influence or airspace, such as the Philippines or Hawaii. Exercises and beneficial contact with the United States forces, though, came to an end following exercise Cope Thunder, staged in the Philippines, and exercise Triad, both held in 1984. New Zealand's adoption of a nuclear-free policy saw to that. The country's armed forces quickly found themselves isolated from a valuable ally and armament supplier following the inevitable crash of the ANZUS Alliance. A New Zealand government defence review in 1983 had identified the need to expand the role of the RNZAF and Skyhawk replacement was a consideration in that review. The Air Force had three options, one of which included retention of their existing Skyhawks and supplementing them with additional second-hand aircraft. Timing, as they say, is everything, as the Australian Navy's A4G aircraft and their spares were offered to New Zealand, an offer culminating in a $40 million deal in 1984. The Australian Navy Fleet Air Arm had outlived its sustainability, the sign still evident today with these recent pictures of decaying trackers at Nowra. Australia's A4Gs were ferried to New Zealand in three batches in July of 1984. Here's the picture here, and it's uh, of uh, Lieutenant Commander John Hamilton giving the keys uh, to myself. He was CO of uh, 724 Squadron at the time. It was certainly a um, sad moment for him. I can remember that distinctly. He was very opposed to the sale of the A4s, and the Navy were, were very sad to lose them. But it, their loss was certainly our gain. And uh, we had a couple of rides with them at Nara, and then uh, flew them across the ditch. It was just an ideal opportunity to then set up a training squadron for the A4 so that 75 Squadron could be the you know, the operational squadron. So, two squadron was, uh, which was an ex Wellington squadron of the reserve, was was used as the squadron name and uh, set up as Ohakia to to take on the training aspect of the A4s. Uh, that was a great challenge, and it uh, it was a lot of fun, and we had a uh, very efficient little unit there. With 22 Skyhawks now in service. $28.6 million was earmarked for total fleet refurbishment, which included modification to the A4Gs to bring them up to A4K specifications. For a time, though, the A4Gs flew in Australian Navy camouflage colours and without structural alterations. But airframes alone do not, of themselves, make an efficient fighting unit. The entire strike wing fleet was still woefully short on avionics, navigation and weapons packages to take them into the modern maritime strike, sea, air and land interdiction roles. To fill this yawning gap, in March 1986, a $140 million contract was awarded to Leah Siegler of New York to supply modern systems for the A4 aircraft. The Kahu update, as the project became known, was to become one of the cornerstones of New Zealand's defence strategies. By late 1990, the RNZAF had, in most respects, the means to support its role as annotated in the 1983 Defence Review. 
Behind the scenes, a new defence arrangement with Australia had been negotiated. Australia, with its old Skyhawk aircraft now on the other side of the Tasman, found itself without a suitable aircraft to meet Navy training requirements. New Zealand was invited to fill that role with its A4K aircraft. Two squadron of the RNZAF found itself ensconced at the Australian Navy establishment at Nara, and operational flying under a five-year agreement commenced in February of 1991. Oh, When uh, the uh, fleet air arm uh, lost its uh, fixed wing fighter uh, aircraft, i.e. the A4s, to New Zealand, they, uh, that left a gap in the, uh, in the Royal Australian Navy's uh, air defence training. And uh, that was unfilled for a number of years until um, the RNZF was asked to, to, uh, to step in with, uh, with A4s again. Yep, we have six aircraft based there. Uh, Currently we have two T-Birds and, and four models there. Um, now that fluctuates a, a little bit in the next changeover, there will be three T-Birds. But our role is in a, a, uh, an OCU for the Skyhawk, uh, so hence we have the, the greater proportion of, of T-Birds. So we do the uh, type conversion to the Skyhawk. So we, we'll get students from the Mackie fighter lead-in training and uh, they do a, a four-month course uh, to convert to the Skyhawk. We, we only have uh, 55 personnel and uh, of those uh, about 10 are officers so we have uh, eight air crew and, and two ground officers. Um, and we have 1700 hours a year to fly. Um, the thing there is that we've got a uh, pretty high calibre of, of uh, tradesmen and just personnel generally on the squadron because of our remote location we, we need pretty resourceful people on the unit. The other thing is that there are no distractions. There aren't any parades, there aren't any um, secondary duties. The guys over there are totally focused on doing, number one, a good job for the Australian Navy, and number two, training Skyhawk pilots. This arrangement continues today, funded jointly by New Zealand and Australia. Today, attack wing trainings posted to two squadron at Nara, an experienced pilot with 75 squadron in Ohakia can all call on a new training aid designed to both supplement and reinforce actual flying training. Pilots can now fly missions in the RNZAF's Hotshot Combat Tactics Trainers, a facility developed by the Israeli Defense Forces to assist in honing Skyhawk pilot skills. Essentially static, powerful computer-driven combat trainers, each hotshot module emulates many of the functions which would be experienced on actual missions. As a result of the upgrade to the avionics that uh, happened to the A4 with the Kahu, um, there's quite a sophisticated set of uh, avionics on board the aeroplane now and because there's such a wide range of uh, um, options for the pilot to use and different uh, methods to use of the system, uh, it can be quite easy for, for people to become uncurrent and a little bit rusty in certain aspects of the, uh, of the nav attack system. So this gives us a chance to uh, stick the pilots in. Uh, it basically mirrors all the avionics and uh, nav attack uh, equipment on the aeroplane and he can just practice to uh, get his fingers working and uh, his currency back to speed. But we have uh, two instructors here, the two QFIs. We'll um, program certain scenarios and depending on the training system uh, package that we're doing at the time. So whatever the emphasis for the squadron is during certain periods of the year, uh, we can come in here and uh, try and create a scenario that uh, would reflect the sort of uh, things that we would uh, come up against for real uh, in those sort of situations. So air to ground threats, uh, air to air threats, um, those sort of things, surface to air threats, uh, we can put all that uh, in the system here. Okay, what you can see is uh, up front we have uh, a view of the, uh, the world outside. This uh, gives us uh, an indication of the head up display. Uh, as we come down here is a, a copy of the um, uh, data entry panel that uh, pilots access uh, different information to and the two screens that are used for um, uh, either the radar or accessing data for the pilot. So um, 
the throttle hands and the throttle uh, set of sticks here. It's called HOTAS, hands on throttle and stick. Uh, these are actual real pieces out of the aircraft. So the person can sort of fly around, he can see what the scenario is, and he can try and use the system to its, its best advantage, as he would in the air, uh, so that when he actually goes out and flies, he's not uh, trying to remember how to use it. He's already worked it uh, on the system here. Okay, what we have down here is, um, really this is uh, an access of information to the pilot. Uh, we have two screens. One is uh, primarily for the, the radar picture that the pilot will see while he's flying for the air-to-air -air radar or air-to-ground. And the other one is really uh, like a, um, an information access uh, screen. And what that sort of does is that uh, all the information that we used to have stored down in the, uh, in the books down the back of the cockpit, we still have those, but at least we've got a lot of information that you can access in front of you. You don't have to fiddle around with the books. Um, I'll show you some of the things that we can get here. Um, if you can see the screen there, there's uh, certain information that uh, tells the pilot how his nav aids, radios are, are set. And then we go to a different menu page and it uh, lets us access different types of information that, that might be important to the pilot. So how his radios are set up, um, how his nav aids are set up, tuning, air to ground weapons, uh, which are all preloaded before we go flying so we don't have to uh, do that in the air. Uh, any nav waypoints uh, and all those sort of, sort of things. So there's a lot of information that we can store into the computer and access through these screens uh, so the pilot can, um, at, the, at the flick of a button, he can access that information straight away. Uh, you can see maybe on this one here, if I uh, swap them around, I'll just we can swap the two pictures around. Uh, you can see on this one here is the radar screen that the pilot would see and uh, that'll, that'll give us all different information depending on the mode of radar that we're, we're in. You can see a ground map mode there. Um, on that one there, there's an anti-shipping type uh, C uh, radar mode, and uh, obviously the the air-to-air -air one, which uh, which we've seen before. So, good good information access for the pilot. Uh, certain bits of information can be changed down on these screens here, and will be mirrored up on the uh, the head-up display. For example, steering to different uh, nav points, uh, information for a an air-to-ground or air-to-air -air weapons program uh, is basically set down here but projected up on the head-up display, so um, so they, they, they tend to time with each other as far as the, the nav attack system goes. But this establishment thrives on the real thing. Flying is its business, in every sense of the word. Wing Commander Gavin House, 75 Squadron's commanding officer, explains some of the major systems which assist pilots to meet both flying and defence roles. This is the A4 Skyhawk. Can you tell us a wee bit about it and what the systems are? Okay, the A4K Skyhawk, we've had them for 25 years. Uh, single seat, the one we have here. Uh, it's an air, air, air ground attack machine, is basically what it is, with uh, some capabilities for air to air. Um, and we operate them here at number 75 squadron. We have 14 of them on 75 and six of them at number 2 squadron in Australia. In the, the front three or four feet here, uh, Terry, what we've got fitted is the uh, APG-66 uh, radar. Uh, it's essentially the same radar as fitted to the F-16. We've had to modify the antenna a little bit so it would fit into the nose. Uh, so essentially the forward compartment is the, uh, the radar and the radar antenna. Uh, the capabilities of the radar are air to air, which it has an excellent capability for. Uh, air to sea modes, which is what we primarily uh, bought it for, being maritime attackers, uh, has excellent capability to track sea targets, and is uh, very, 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 very much key in our capability to uh, produce and shoot the the AM, AGM-65 Maverick, um, and also in the delivery of uh, our TOS bombs. Does it have a navigational role? It can have a navigational role. We've uh, got a ground map capability. The old radar in here used to be the APG-53, which exactly was that. It had a terrain clearance mode. Uh, this radar doesn't have one, uh, but we can paint the terrain in ground map or in a C mode. Uh, around the other side of the aircraft here, there's this uh, huge probe-like proboscis here, I suppose you could almost describe it as. Can you tell me what that does? Yes, what this is is a, a fixed air-to-air -air refueling probe uh, for the Skyhawk. It enables us to air-to-air -air refuel. Uh, the Skyhawk pilot will, uh, will fly his aircraft in formation behind uh, a tank aircraft and he will need to be uh, reasonably smooth to uh, the fly the probe into the basket which has been trailed from a, uh, an air refueling tanker in front.
ongoing development of CDR, or the Closer Defence Relationship with Australia, has brought with it a new capability for the RNZAF. Seen here exercising with a 75 Squadron Skyhawk, a Royal Australian Air Force Boeing 707 air-to-air -air refuelling tanker is in New Zealand skies on its first operational deployment of 75 Squadron. Access to operational support facilities such as the tanker have the potential to greatly enhance radius of action and deployment capabilities for the Skyhawks. So is there a case for New Zealand to maintain its own tankers? In simple terms you couldn't say no to that. You couldn't say no we don't need a tanker because uh, we're down the bottom of the end of the world and somehow we'll get to where we need to go. Uh, given more funding uh, it would it would probably be, make very good sense for us to have our own tanker capability other than the buddy to buddy system we have in the A4. That means we could deploy the A4 non-stop somewhere. On the other hand if we can work together there's no point in us buying another expensive commodity which we may not be able to fully utilise that is when you're not needing it um, if the Australians uh, can supply that. I can't see us ever going it alone in a serious situation and one of our outputs says if Australia is in, in, in deep smoke then we are their boots and all. And, and there's words like the entire uh, committed resources of the New Zealand Defence Force, because that would probably be in New Zealand's interest. And it's not just a question of rushing to help Australia. I mean, we've got to act in what are New Zealand's interests. And I can't see that anything that ultimately, in a very serious situation, if it's in Australia's interest, has got to be in ours. I notice on the uh, earlier Skyhawks, or not the earlier ones perhaps, but even these before they were updated, those probes were actually straight and they came right, right along the front of the nose. Yeah. Is there a reason for the change? Yeah, well there was. Uh, in the early days it went straight down, but you'll see that in that line also is the, uh, the right intake. And occasionally on uh, connection and disconnect, uh, some fuel is able to come from the basket and go down the intake. And that has caused engine surges in the past. Although now rare, fuel ingestion into engine intakes is still a health hazard for the A4s. As we're over the South Island right now anyway, we'll dive down to RNZAF Base Woodburn to investigate further. Here at the small aircraft maintenance flight, an A4 is undergoing repairs following a fuel ingestion incident. Well, my understanding of what happened there is that uh, during an in-flight flight refueling, they took uh, some fuel down the intake and the fuel that was ignited by the hot end of the engine and forced a great deal of air back forward up the intake creating some damage to the intake skin. Now that aircraft is now down here for both assessment and potential repair of that intake skin quite simply because the engine in a Skyhawk requires the profile of the intake to be quite smooth. Most major Skyhawk airframe repair and cyclical maintenance work is carried out at the small aircraft maintenance flight. Damage from wheels up landings caused by whatever reason can keep an aircraft here for months. If an aircraft does indeed land with, uh, with its undercarriage up, we would be responsible in most cases for the, for the repair of that accident. I've still got the air traffic tape and on uh, first hearing from the tower that a wheel was missing, my first reply was bloody hell. But uh, then uh, training and instincts, I suppose, take over. I was short on gas. There was no time to fluff about. There were drills to be gone into. Um, just uh, prizing the situation, seizing it up, and getting the jet back on the ground in short order, really. And it's surprising, looking back on it, there's lots of people in uh, US experience that have had to, for some reason, gear problems, unsuitabilities, have had to land either on the tanks or just on the belly of the clean jet. And it performs quite well. You stop in a hurry, you try to get rid of what gas you have. In my case, um, there was a very small fire, uh, just a little bit of residual fuel in the drop tanks. It uh, ignited, looked impressive, I suppose, then extinguished. By the time it came to a halt, there was uh, no real risk of fire, and you shut the engine down straight away. Flying high-performance attack aircraft has always been a high-risk occupation. In spite of this, the Skyhawk accident rate has been surprisingly low. And after 25 years and many thousands of flying hours, the RNZAF has lost only four 
out of its 24 A4s. The speed at which accidents can occur, though, is illustrated by this piece of footage. The pilot explains. And I'd uh, just gone past, I think it was Woody Anger at the time, um, flying at 250 feet and around about 420, 430 knots, a couple of miles off the coast. And everything was going as it should be when all of a sudden, looking in front, a uh, bird appeared right in the middle of the HUD. And um, as I saw it, it obviously saw me at the same time because it started to tuck its wings down and roll inverted and go for the big dive away from me. But uh, at the distance we were apart, it wasn't going to manage that from 430 knots. So uh, I attempted to roll left, and having seen the HUD videotape afterwards, the roll had obviously occurred afterwards, smacked into each other, because next thing I uh, experienced was a very loud bang, and they uh, thumped through the airframe. And at the same time, I lost most of my electrics. So the, uh, the HUD went down and uh, lost some of my comms and that. But the main thing I noticed at the time was losing the, uh, losing the HUD. However, the gauges had been fine and the engine just purred along nicely. Um, however, when I looked down the intake and saw the damage to the intake itself and all the bits of metal sitting up against the uh, compressor um, front stage, it occurred to me that if any of those bigger bits of metal had gone down the engine, I probably would have been sitting in a dinghy at that stage a couple of miles off Woody Angle or something. Over the years, the A4s have progressively enjoyed weapons updates to keep them abreast of global developments. By and large, the Skyhawk's range of weaponry is competitive although it's conceded a better maritime standoff capability would be a decided advantage. Let's return to Wing Commander House to talk about some of the weaponry the A4s carry today. The A4 has two Mark 12 uh, 20 mm cannons, one on each side of the nose, uh, a 20 mm round, probably about yay big, um, and a rate of fire about 950 rounds a minute. Uh, we can carry a total capacity of around about 175 rounds, which is about six seconds fire. What we've got here, Terry, is uh, the AGM-65G Maverick. Uh, this version here is an infrared version, which enables us to uh, fly at night, identify our target, and uh, to be able to shoot the missile uh, all in the, uh, the hours of darkness. Okay, Gavin, I noticed that um, this Maverick has, in fact, what looks like a glass dome. Is that what it is? Yeah, why? because this missile is infrared, uh, it doesn't have a clear dome like the television guided one. Uh, this allows infrared radiation to, uh, to pass through the dome, to be able to go back through to uh, provide the picture to the uh, pilot on his display unit of the infrared radiation from the target. OK, Gavin, we're actually standing at a different aircraft now, but I notice that you've got the same missile on this aircraft, uh, but it's got a completely different front on the missile. It's not opaque anymore, it's clear, and I notice a little television camera in here. Can you explain what's going on here? Yeah, Terry, this is the, the B Maverick. The one we saw before was the, the, the G, which had the opaque nose, the infrared uh, version. This is the, the B television version. Uh, they essentially uh, have the same function, but what is presented to the pilot on his two uh, television displays in the cockpit, we've got a, a television picture, or we can have an infrared picture displayed to the pilot. So no matter what the seeker is, the pilot still interacts with the missile the same way. The only difference between the B Maverick, this one, and the G is it has a smaller warhead uh, but it, and it has a slightly longer range due to the, the weight difference of the warhead. Just looking at the camera head itself inside the little dome here, it seems to give you a fairly wide angle of view. Would that be true or is it narrow? Yes, this is a uh, times four magnification. So the pilot is not viewing the, a real television picture, he's seeing a magnified version. And it gives him around about uh, a 20 degree arc of, of visual. Okay, and that camera can actually follow the target? Yes, the pilot can slew uh, the missile on the throttle, and it will slew the television camera to, to whatever target he's looking at. He can lock the missile on, even though it's not looking straight on the bore side, it could be looking off to the side. And when he fires the missile, the missile will come off and turn the corner. Once the missile is fired, does the pilot still see the image? No. Once no. The, uh, the pilot pulls the trigger, 
The umbilical cord is pulled out from the, uh, from the launcher and that is all contact is lost with the missile at that stage. But what of the Skyhawk's own defensive systems? An arrangement here. Can you tell me what that's for? Yeah, this is one of the aerials for the ALR-66 radar warning receiver. Uh, we have one on each wingtip and one antenna on each side of the tailpipe. And uh, their purpose is to detect incoming uh, radar emissions, to classify the direction on which it's coming from, and to present to the pilot the band, its pulse width, so the pilot knows what type of radars are illuminating him. Okay, is that quite important, is it? You know, oh, very, very important. In fact, if we're, uh, we're out there trying to do a mission, uh, it's uh, very important to know that there's a, a, an enemy system out there that is using radar to uh, guide its missile. If we know they're there, we can either avoid them or we can use our chaff to uh, decoy the missiles. And I was out here on the flight line a few weeks ago filming and I noticed the guys fitting uh, some, something into this uh, bucket arrangement here and I noticed there's one on the other side too. What, what was actually going on there? What they were loading, Terry, was the ALE-39 uh, chaff and flare dispenser. Uh, they are modules which fit straight in on each side. The, the flare, when ejected downwards, goes behind the aircraft. And what it is, it's a, uh, a, a large flare with a large infrared signature. And hopefully that decoys an infrared guided missile. Uh, the other expendable is the chaff, which comes out and uh, is selected by the pilot, which blooms behind the aeroplane in the turbulence which represents the radar cross-section of the aircraft. And hopefully if there's a radar watching the aircraft, it can see this bloom behind the aeroplane. And what we're looking for is the radar to switch lock onto the chaff. Okay. Now when we talk in terms of chaff, of course, we're not talking about stock food here, are we? I mean, we're, we're talking about something completely different. Exactly. Can you explain what it is? Yeah. It's um, aluminium foil, uh, which is cut to about half the wavelength of the, the radar in which we're trying to jam. Uh, very, very fine filaments, and uh, the, when the maintenance people are fitting it, you'll notice that they are wearing respirators, because uh, when one of those chaff modules get away on you, it can be uh, quite toxic. Okay. And uh, by cutting it to about half the wavelength, that gives the best return to um, you know the enemy type radars. Yes. So, so it's moving in the air all the time. The radar is illuminating it, and it, their signature has been re-radiated back to the host radar, and hopefully creating a false target. The Royal New Zealand Air Force today runs lean and mean. Often overlooked is that this service is a multi-billion dollar organization dependent on an infrastructure which faces many tasks and many difficulties. Tasks and difficulties with global connotations. Although attack wing's responsibilities rarely, if ever, see the A4K Skyhawks ranging further afield than the Pacific Basin or Southeast Asia, they are as dependent on the total service infrastructure as any other arm of the service. Um, so often we see the Air Force out there and operating and the, uh, the visible output is the aircraft in the air. And uh, obviously there's a lot of people behind the scenes keeping those aircraft going. Uh, it just doesn't relate to the people on the squadron, the maintainers. Uh, it relates right back through the supply network and the administration network uh, in order to keep those people happy, uh, keep those people fed uh, and keep them well paid. A salient point on which to bring to a close this overview of a continuing story. Royal New Zealand Air Force A4K Skyhawks are destined to fly until at least the year 2007. By then, most will have been operational for 37 years. A handful, those purchased from Australia, for 40 years. The aircraft type which will replace the A4s is today an uncertainty. However, the global defence industry will be hard pressed to produce an aircraft of the A4's capabilities and longevity. In its right element, down low, um, over jungle in particular, there's very little that, that can touch it and it can do the job really well. It's, it's now got good navigation that you can um, pinpoint targets to within less than a mile by using the onboard navigation system. You've got um, a good weapons aiming system. You can use uh, laser guided weapons. 
and you've got radar to pick up uh, band features, enemy air, whatever. So it's a bit of a handful for the pilot, I, I would think, but um, potentially you've got a very, very uh, effective weapon. It's, I'd say that the people in the, in the A4 business, to answer your question, going back to that, they are they're doing an exciting job. Flying's a hot, dirty, debilitating business. It's not a glamorous business. If there's a bit of glamour in it, it's because of perceptions of other people who are not involved in it and a sense of satisfaction from a, from a job well done. What I found coming here was a very practical uh, aspect of flying, and that was that uh, you did things and they were intelligent things and common sense things to do. When the weather was bad, we didn't fly. When the weather was good, we went out and we flew as best we could. The maintenance here was very good. The airplane was uh, a very simple airplane to fly and a very practical airplane as far as uh, fuel economy and, uh, and for speeds and everything, it was very close to the F-4 and the strike roll. I guess good things come in small packages. You know, it was a, it was a pilot's airplane. Um, yeah, it was everything a, a young guy could wish for at the time. Sure, there are better things around now, although, you know, with the, with the update, it, it's still a, an upfront airplane. And it's, uh, you know, how it was in Vietnam from go to woe, it was uh, still flying in combat well after its replacement was out of production. Um, so, a marvellous little airplane. And really, we couldn't have had anything better. Now, we haven't been able to pit our skills against the Americans uh, for some years. But what we have been able to prove is that we can hold our own against any player that we currently have contact with. And that's purely by sorting out our procedures and working at it, and then occasionally getting to test them. And I think that's very satisfying when you are not up with, say, the Americans or the British operating alongside them. But I think we could, uh, if we had to, we could very easily. The other thing that impresses me in my time is that the younger people now are far more professional than we ever were, far more dedicated and far more knowledgeable. And I think that uh, gives a lot of credit to you know, the capability that is there and coming up. I believe that there is a, um, a poor understanding of exactly how capable the, uh, the Skyhawk is. Many people will still look at it, and because externally it looks the same as the, uh, the A4K uh, that we bought, which were F models uh, with a VHF radio put in them, um, and they don't realise the extent of the update that we have done, and the way that that uh, expands uh, the capability of the aeroplane. And I think that a few people are coming to realise just how capable it is, the Skyhawk's great for the job that it does. It's an excellent beast. And with the kit we've got on board now, we can hold our own, as you know, against uh, most of the other, um, our friends in the uh, Southeast Asian region, including the Australians with F-18s. Often, it's not just the aircraft people are flying, it's the person you're fighting. And tactics come into play there. The, the Skyhawk as it exists now, uh, does very well at holding its own in the modern air forces. What you've got is a hybrid aircraft, which is uh, very old technology as far as a flying machine goes. And now with Kahu, you have very new technology as far as avionics and systems. That enables it to stand up well against a, a more modern aircraft. And uh, when you add in the fact that the training system produces some very capable operators, you can then get the best out of an old airframe tied up with modern avionics. And you actually have an airplane that performs very well when you consider it was originally designed in the 50s. It's, uh, I think the reason, well certainly the reason that I enjoy the role is that it's, uh, it's the satisfaction of basically uh, operating uh, a weapons platform, uh, you know, single-handedly. It's, it's a, it's a one-man job and you're there and to, to do it well is in, immensely satisfying. And it's all, on the other hand, if you're not doing a job well, if you're having a bad day, it's immensely frustrating. Uh, that's really all I can say. And you know, on a good day, it's it's the best job in the world. But on a bad day, it's uh, you know you can die doing it. It's given us a lot of good service, and we're going to see it uh, into the next century. And I think the engine is actually uh, well designed, and and uh, it's it's one of the better things the Air Force has had things to do with over the years. Obviously, <laughs> they're still going, and uh, they're still going well.
Aviation.